<laughs> oh boy, today we have another burn burner. So put some flame retardant on your burns because we have the little Sony ZV-E10 versus the little Canon R10. Now th this is one of my most requested videos of all time. These two things, they might be small, but they are juggernauts of the entry level mirrorless market and entry level is still not free. So remember that. However, that is what these companies call these cameras. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some footage and I'm going to talk about the good points and bad points of each of these cameras. So uh, it's Friday night. My family's asleep. Well, when I'm recording this, I don't know when I'm going to upload it, but uh, let's talk about it. So first I want to give a big shout out to B&H Photo who supplied the Canon R10 for this review. I've been using it for about a month. They let me keep it for a month and uh, so I can have a good review against the little Sony ZV-E10 which I have had for about a year. So now here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you some side by side footage of the cameras and then I am going to do the thing that people seem to like on my channel where I list the pros and the cons in list form written on the screen so that it is nice and clear so you can figure out maybe which camera is better for you. So enough of the rambling here, let's get straight into the test. Now a lot of people, they want to see these cameras in standard mode. I will be doing like right now, on the GH5, first of all, GH5, still fantastic in 2022, am I right? I didn't want to do any fanboyism. I didn't want to skew the results by having one of the companies shoot this video. I'm shooting it on a neutral Panasonic. It's like Switzerland over here, the lovely Panasonic. It is a little Panasonic G G7, my first ever mirrorless camera. I still love you, buddy. We got, we got to keep this going. I like this two angle setup with these Panasonic cameras. These guys bang free buck, but we're not here to talk about Panasonic, even though I do love these cameras. Let's just go out to Handsome Alley here uh, next to my house, and I will show you the standard settings because I know a lot of the times people are going to be beginners when they're picking up this camera, so they're, people are going to want to see what uh, they look like in standard settings. Plus, in my other videos, people say that all the time. Can you please show it in the standard and the auto settings? And sure, uh, sure, here it is. So that is what you will get right there if you just press record straight out of the box and you let the camera do all the work for you. Of course, you can do much better than that. These cameras are capable of much more. So I will show you what I would use in these situations and I would use the HDR 10-bit mode on the Canon and I would use the HL3, HL3, HLG3 picture profile on the Sony and I would uh, apply a grade. So here that is. <music> So I think both images look fantastic in that last set. Yes, I was in there and that really, really helps. But once you learn to color grade a little bit or you do what I do, which is you stick on a leaming corrective LUT and then do a little bit of adjusting, you can get just such great images out of either of these cameras. So it is up to personal preference. But speaking of that, I will show you what they look like here in the studio. Now I am only using the kit lens, which I would not recommend for either of these cameras. The kit lenses on these guys, they, they just, they're okay. You know what I mean? But in this studio, like my background lights are kind of dark. So you're gonna see noise in the image. You're gonna see, it's not a great image. And I would, uh, if I were to use the kit lenses in here, I would have to bump up all of the lights in the background a lot, or maybe sit in front of a window and get some natural sunlight. Uh, because when you have a dark studio like I do, you want something like right now I'm using F2 on the Panasonic and uh, that comes out quite nice. I'm also using Vlog on the Panasonic, so uh, it's great for color grading. But anyway, here is what they look like in standard settings in my little dark studio. Thank you. 
And now, of course, I will show you again what I do in the studio. I used a leaming LUT for both of these to correct them, so uh, check that out. Once again, a huge improvement in my opinion, and I would take either of these images. I will say that uh, the Canon with the 10 bit, it, uh, it let me color grade more, of course, because you have far, far more color information in 10 bit images. But uh, I use the ZV-E10 in here all the time, but I use a Sigma 1.4 lens on F2 and that looks great. Even in 8-bit, I don't have to do a huge amount of color grading, so the image never falls apart. It's good to have good lenses and good lighting. Good lenses and good lighting with an 8-bit camera is better than, you know, bad lenses and bad lighting with a 10-bit camera. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, of course, it's better to have 10 bits like I have here on the Panasonic. But anyway, both images, fantastic. So now let's go do a little stabilization test. And once again, I will use auto settings because I know a lot of you will do that starting out. Okay, so right now we are only using kit lens stabilization. So I will walk carefully because this footage will be fairly shaky. And as you can see, the Sony is a fair bit wider. That's because the Sony uses a 1.5 times crop and uh, the Canon uses a 1.6 times crop relative to full frame. Plus the Canon lens is 18 to 45 and the Sony kit lens is 16 to 45. So, oh sorry, 16 to 50. So if you are buying uh, the kit lenses with the cameras, this is a, the field of view that uh, you will be seeing. Sorry, I'm a little flustered. There's a lot of people in the park and I'm trying to look confident, but, but I'm not, I'm not a confident person. Also, I'm using all auto settings again. So you can see how the cameras do in terms of the white balance and the shutter speed and the different ISO changes and uh, when I'm walking in and out of the shade. And plus that is the way a lot of people will be using this. If they're picking it up first, they will be beginners and they'll want to use the auto settings. So this is what the auto settings look like. And now this is the digital crop, the first level on the Canon. It has two levels and this is the only level that Sony has in terms of digital stabilization. It does have one more level and that is Catalyst Browse. But right now we're just using the cameras crop and as you can see it crops in 1.44 times that's a big old crop and the canon is actually pretty similar at this point in terms of the field of view and you know earlier i said i was flustered when there's a lot of people in the park there's this guy doing sprints and he felt awkward that i was there you know we're all just doing our own thing and we're all completely screwed up so anyway let's uh, move on to the next mode now this is the enhanced mode with the Canon and that is a mighty crop in and of itself. The ZV-E10 is here. I'm gonna hold it a bit further away, use my shoulder muscles, which are very, very nice by the way. So uh, I'm holding it a bit further away here, but I would not use this mode in Canon because I don't find the enhanced, the stabilization works that much better. Plus the crop is just too big. I like the regular digital stabilization coming out of the Canon R10. And this is the best you can do with the Sony if you're only gonna use the camera. Now let's do that Catalyst Browse that I was talking about. Now this is the Catalyst Browse. So what you do is you just run your footage through the free program Catalyst Browse. And uh, because the camera can record gyroscopic data, it comes out this smooth gimbal-like. It is fantastic, but you do need a bit of processing power and it does take some time. About three minutes to render a one minute clip. And the Canon, I have put it on my favorite mode of stabilization, which is the first level of digital stabilization. So this is how I would use the Canon camera, and this is how I would use the Sony camera. Well, I wouldn't have it in all auto settings. I would do fancy things, but this is the stabilization mode that I would use. In case you're wondering about the stability test, I put it on this rod here. I attached my little Ulanzi selfie stick tripod and I just walked around with them so that they would have the exact same experience and it wouldn't be subjective. So now I will show you all three modes for both cameras, not in auto settings. This is color graded myself again using the HLG3 picture profile and the HDR profile from the Canon.
Now, when it comes to photos for both of these cameras, they're gonna do a great job. They have good sensors with decent dynamic range, especially for APS-C cameras. And, uh, you know, in all these photos I've taken here, I've either pressed the auto settings in Lightroom or applied the exact same preset. And uh, you are hard pressed, at least if you're me, to tell the difference between the two photos. So obviously they are capable photo cameras, but in terms of usability, the Canon will get the win here in terms of, uh, it's got a nice bigger grip. My pinky does slip off because it's still a very small little camera, but it has the EVF. That's so great for taking photos, the electronic viewfinder, not just on a sunny day, period. Uh, photographers generally prefer to look through that EVF. It helps you frame up your shot uh, better. And uh, the LCD screen, if you want to use that, is also better on the Canon. You can still get great images on the ZV E10, but the Canon does make it easier to get those great images. And in terms of handling, that is totally personal preference. Some people like the small little form factor of the ZV E10, and other people want a bigger grip so that it is easier to carry. More pocketable, this guy, and a solid, more solid feeling. This guy is a little more airy, but it still feels good, and it does have that good grip. So in terms of taking photos, I would rather take around the Canon than the ZV E10, but certainly, I take around the ZV E10 plenty for photos. And now, since everybody loves a low light test, here is the low light test between these two cameras. Now the Sony definitely fared a lot better in the low light test, but something the Sony is not very good at is rolling shutter. Now, unfortunately, neither is the R10. The R10 might be a little bit better, but uh, here, let me show you the test. So both are really, really bad for rolling shutter. So uh, the ZV-E10 is probably a little bit worse, but they're both absolutely terrible. So be careful with your whips and pans. And if you are filming the Tour de France, these two cameras are probably not your bag. You don't go to the NASCAR race with these guys expecting to get nice video footage. Everything's gonna be all slanty. So now let's do the thing where we list which camera is better at what thing, but remember these two cameras are great for a lot of purposes. Right here, they both have 24 megapixel sensors. They can take great photo, they can take great video. They don't have record limits in video. The battery life is surprisingly good for these old batteries that are in this thing. Uh, this guy gets about 90 minutes of 4K and uh, the Canon gets about 82 minutes of 4K and uh, there's no overheating. You set the internal temperature to high on the Sony and as long as you keep the screens open on these guys and these guys on tripods in regular temperatures, they do not overheat. The battery will die before they overheat. And if you hook them up to external power, which you can do to both of them through USB-C, they also won't overheat for hours and hours. So I've never gotten them to overheat in those types of situations. So then what's better about one than the other? Okay, so let's go. The Sony, first of all, has a headphone port, which is great for monitoring your audio. The Canon R10 does not have a headphone jack. I do not know why they didn't include that, but they didn't. The Canon has a 2.36 million dot EVF, which is not the world's most fantastic EVF, but it's not bad. And it's an EVF, an electronic viewfinder. You know, you look through the thing so that you can take a picture or some video. This does not have one of those, which makes taking photos with this guy much more cumbersome for photographers who are used to having an EVF, which is most photographers. A lot of the people these days are just clicking on the back of the screen anyway. So for those people, it might not be a big deal, but uh, I really miss the EVF. Uh, when I am taking photos. I am used to it by now, but I definitely prefer an EVF. Huge point for the Canon. And another point for the Canon while we're at it about the screens is that 
This actually has a much worse screen than the Canon. Neither screen is fantastic, but the Canon screen looks a lot better and uh, you can see what you're doing on the screen much better. So it all it has an EVF and the screen is better. On the Sony, the picture looks usually blown out and you can't really tell how good your image is, but uh, you get used to it going, I know when I get back home on the computer, that the footage is gonna look fantastic, and it does, but it's just the screen itself is not impressive, and it is not a touchscreen. This guy has a wonderful touchscreen interface, uh, very responsive. It is a much better experience with the touchscreen. And while we're at it, let's go one more for the Canon, and that is the menus. Now, I am very used to the Sony menus, and I don't have a problem with it at all. I can manipulate the entire thing while I'm uh, looking at the front of the camera. I can just touch the buttons on the back because I'm quite used to it. And with the Canon, you, if you're a beginner, you're probably going to like their menu system better. This ZV-E10 still has the old Sony menus, which people find clunky and hard to understand. Whereas the Canon, now don't get me wrong, it's still a camera. You have to learn your menu system, but it is more intuitive. It's easier to use, especially with the touch screen. So again, for menus, the point goes to Canon. My hair's looking a little ridiculous here on the monitor. Speaking of monitors. So let's do a couple for the Sony. Uh, when it comes to external monitors, my goodness, it is much easier to use the Sony with external monitors. You just plug it in and if you're in 4K, then uh, you see the picture on the screen, you see the picture on the monitor. On the Canon R10, when you hook it up to an external monitor, the screen, the touch screen, the nice LCD touch screen that I just talked about, that goes black and you can't use the touch screen. Now you can go into another mode that uh, enables you to use the touch screen and have a clean HDMI out, but then you can't record internally. So you have to record externally, and which is okay for streaming and things like that, but if you wanna record internally, then that's no bueno. And in fact, there is no way to record internally while recording externally and getting a clean feed because even if you turn all of the displays off on the Canon, when you press record or here like on my Ninja 5, the big red REC pops up on the screen. So now I could just, if that didn't happen, I could have recorded a clean feed on my Ninja 5 and also recorded uh, internally on the Canon R10, but they don't let you do that. The Zebras are better on the Sony in that they work in HDR. In the HLG3, your Zebras work just fine, but on the Canon, when you switch over to the 10-bit HDR, which of course I want to use, the Zebras are not accurate past about, I think, 75. Once you get past 75, the Zebras, they just don't work anymore. So they will even tell you in the manual that they will not show you where the highlights end uh, with the Zebras on the HDR mode. So then you have to bring a, an external monitor and do your Zebras through that if you like to use Zebras. And I just told you the external monitoring situation is a bit of a pain in the butt with Canon. So then you might think, well, let me just use my histogram for the Canon. But the histogram disappears when you press record. There's all these weird little finicky things with the uh, lower priced Canon cameras. Lower price, still $1,000 American. But anyway, we'll get to the price in a minute. But there's these finicky things like the histogram will disappear as soon as you press record in video. So now in Sony, the histogram will stay. You will be able to use your zebras. You're able to use your external monitoring. So a lot of that is just for me, that's, those are big deals. But speaking of big deals, and I've mentioned it a few times, but 10 bit, this guy has 10 bit. So yes, I will use an external uh, monitor to make sure that my you know, exposure is correct because I can't trust the zebras on this guy and my histogram disappears. So I definitely want to use an external monitor, but you do get 10 bit footage, which is absolutely fantastic. I wish it had C-Log3. Boy, if this had C-Log3, this would have been, I would have bought it immediately, but uh, it has HDR, I can get 10-bit in HDR, I can get by with that. And another one for the Canon, the 4K60. It has 4K60, yes, it's a massive crop. It's something like a 1.6 times crop on top of the already 1.6 times crop for APS-C. So, I mean, you're, go you're cropping way in there. And the footage is still pretty soft. It's not oversampled like the 4K is in this guy. And I will say, yeah, the 4K is oversampled from uh, 6K in this guy and 6K in this guy. So that's great, you get nice sharp footage, but you do the 4K 60, the footage is not oversampled and it looks 
a little bit soft and it punches in a lot, but it's still 4K 60, which is definitely better than not having 4K 60. Okay, so let's go back to Sony. White balancing is easy. You just press custom white balance and you can save three custom white balances, but you can just press a button and get custom white balance in video. This guy, antiquated is the word a lot of people use for it. Cause yeah, you have to switch it over to a photo mode and then take a picture of a gray card, then save that to your custom white balance, then go back to video and go to custom white balance and then select that. And look, I change my white balance everywhere I go. I always do a custom white balance because I'm a professional. I'm a professional idiot. And I will go, when I'm in the shade, I'll change it. If I'm in the car, I will change. I'm changing the white balance constantly. And it is a huge pain in the butt with this guy. I just, I just don't know why they don't have a one button, a one touch white balance. It drives me nuts. Great in low light. This guy is a surprisingly good camera in low light. This camera is not good in low light. So if you're going to be doing a ton of low light shooting, the R10 is not the way to go. The ZV-E10 definitely beats it in that category. But this guy certainly beats it in burst rate. Mechanical shutter, you can do 15 frames per second. Now you can do 11 on the ZV-E10. A lot of people don't know that this can do 11. That's pretty good. It's better than my full frame Sony cameras, my a7 III and my a7 IV. This guy does 11 frames per second in mechanical shutter. Now, this guy will do 23 in electronic shutter, but I don't think you should use the electronic shutter because once again, bad rolling shutter. So your pictures are gonna be slanted if there's fast moving objects or objects moving at all. So stick, I think, with the 15 frames per second, which is still absolutely fantastic. So once again, definitely a win for Canon if you need fast burst rates. Now, of course, as you see in the video, this guy records gyroscopic data. So you can run that through the free program, Catalyst Browse, and uh, you can get gimbal-like footage. So that is a great option to have. So I use, I use it all the time. Some people find it cumbersome and they don't like it and they think it's a gimmick. I use it every single week. So I love it. Crops, the Canon wins in this situation. But a lot of people are confused. When I did the Nikon versus the Nikon Z30 versus the ZV-E10, a lot of people were yelling in my comment section, the Nikon doesn't crop in 4K. Well, the ZV-E10 doesn't crop in any mode in 4K except for 4K 30. That's a 1.23 times crop, I believe, if you're doing uh, 30 frames per second. But if you do 24 or 25, which a lot of people use, there is no crop in 4K. Now in a 120 frames per second, there is a small 1.1 times crop. So you have to factor all of that in, but personally I always use 24 frames per second and uh, the 120 crop, I don't really notice at all. So uh, the, for me, there's not much of a crop factor, but it is something to remember if you are using 30 frames per second. Now the Canon doesn't have a crop in any mode except for 4K 60, which is a giant crop that you will definitely notice. But uh, 4K 24, 25, 30, 120 frames per second, it is all the same in Canon. Now when it comes to the slow motion, the 120 frames per second in HD, there is a difference between these two cameras. They both autofocus great. In fact, the Canon uses eye autofocus, which is a little bit better. But the problem with the Canon and it's 120 frames per second is that uh, not only is there no audio, it just makes the file for you. And the 120 frames per second file it makes, it spits that out as a 30p file. So uh, that is what you're stuck with. You just put it on your timeline, but I like using a 24p timeline. So uh, then I have to make that adjustment in my editor because it comes out as a soundless 30 P file that is already slowed down. Now the Sony, I think it's a much better implementation. You can do that in the S and Q mode for Sony, but they also give you the option of just shooting 120 frames per second with sound. So I can stick that on my uh, 4K timeline and you can hear my dialogue. And uh, the fact is if it'll just still play out at 24 frames per second, but the computer will throw out all the extra files it doesn't need. But then when you want to do slow motion, you can just slow it down. So uh, for those people who want to do speed ramping, going from slow motion to regular motion, and uh, you know, a lot of the YouTubers like to do that with their transitions and stuff like that, the ZV-E10 will give you more options. So I much prefer the slow motion in the ZV-E10 uh, compared to the Canon R10.
So right now I'm recording 120 frames per second and you can hear me speaking normally, but if I wanted to slow it down and then speed it up again, I can do that whenever I want. And uh, that is a great option, I think, on the ZV-E10. Now, my second last point is gonna be about price. There's a reason I am not saving it for last this time. We'll get to that in a second, but uh, this one, the ZV-E10 is quite a reasonable $698 at B&H when you don't buy a lens, whereas the Canon R10 is $979. That is quite a large price difference for these two entry-level cameras. So and now this one does give you 10-bit and an EVF and a better photo experience, but that is a big gap. And uh, now we'll get to my last point. There's an even bigger gap when it comes to price. Well, it's factored in, and that is lens selection. The elephant in the room is lens selection. A lot of people have been talking about how the Canon R mount looks like it's gonna be a closed mount and they're not gonna let third-party lenses in, like the Sigmas, the Tamrons, the Viltrox, the Samyangs, things like that. Whereas the Sony, there are so many affordable, fantastic lenses already available from uh, both Sony and third-party manufacturers. I love the Viltrox 13 millimeter. I love the Sigma 16 mil f1.4, the Sony 11, the, uh, the Tamron, uh, 11 to 20, they're just, the list goes on and on. So many fantastically sharp, affordable lenses that you can get right now. Now for this, if you don't know, if you're new out there, this doesn't have any lenses. There are two APS-C lenses available and uh, they are the two kit lenses for the R7 and the R10. Now you can of course use RF glass. You can use the full frame glass and that will work just fine on uh, the camera, but uh, it'll be a bigger lens. It's not designed directly for it. And a lot of them are, are quite expensive. There are some exceptions, but uh, a lot of the good ones are, uh, are very, very expensive and you, uh, you can adapt. So that's what a lot of people are doing right now is that they are buying the Canon adapter because Canon's not letting third party adapters right now. So they're buying the Canon adapter and adapting the EF glass, the older glass to uh, this camera right here. And that is probably your best option. Now, uh, whether or not you wanna do that, that is up to you, but I will link a very interesting video uh, to Mark Wemels. Uh, he's a friend of mine that I've met through YouTube. He's been a Canon shooter for years and years, and he has a lot of interesting things to say about whether or not you should adapt and why the third party thing is probably not something that's great, especially for new shooters. But anyway, I'll leave it up to you. You go uh, watch that video, but I personally wish that they would let in the third party manufacturers so that especially when you're starting out, there would be a lot of good affordable lenses to buy. And then later, if you wanted to upgrade to the fancy Canon L lenses, get, so be it. But right now, there really aren't very many lens options for this guy if you don't adapt. So of course, I don't know what the future holds for Canon and what lenses they're going to release and if they ever will let Tamron or Sigma or anyone else into the system. But I will say that uh, you really need to do your research on the types of lenses you need because maybe you can find them for the Canon system. And if that's the system you wanna go with, great. Or you already have cameras, full frame cameras. If you have Canon cameras already, you don't need to hear this. But if you don't have them, then uh, please pay attention to the lenses that you think you're gonna need. If you want blurry backgrounds and you want nice sharp lenses, it is not as easy as just running out and picking up ones for this guy because they're not there. Anyway, so even though I've been in the basement, I got pretty excited during this uh, video and I, I probably woke up the family shouting and ranting and raving about these cool little APS-C cameras. The camera market is really great right now and I don't think you can go wrong if you uh, spend a little time figuring out what you need, like watching videos like this one. Anyway, thanks for watching this one and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye. Slow it down and then speed it up again. I can do that whenever I want.